All right, everybody. Topic six. Yeah. We're making it through the semester, folks. We're making it through. All right, so today we're going to talk about um, intimate, intimate partner violence or domestic violence. We'll use those terms interchangeably. Um, I think most people these days, most scholars these days, use the term intimate partner violence because it might be more, um, might be considered more inclusive. Um, but nonetheless, um, this is going to be our topic today: domestic violence, intimate partner violence. Okay. Um, uh, before we begin, I want to make sure that everyone's on the same page here. Uh, this is obviously a serious type of crime we're going to talk about, so you don't necessarily... I'm not going to be joking around as much, um, but also at the same time, uh, there are some pictures included in this video and in this uh, PowerPoint um, that that are kind of graphic, so just be prepared for that. The reason why I have these in here um, is... Because when we talk about domestic violence, sort of conceptually, right, we have this general conception in our minds, but you don't really understand the the gravity of it until you actually see images of it. Um, and it's something that I learned when I was doing ride-alongs uh, for some of my research I've done. Like a lot of the research I do, I, I, I sit on hours and hours and hours of police ride-alongs to see how the police interact with people. And when you see domestic violence, it is um, much different than than sort of when you just think about it conceptually. If you think about, oh, a, a husband beating his wife, right? Um, seeing what that actually looks like and what the aftermath of it looks like. You know, I remember, um, you know, going into a house and, you know, this woman... This this woman, all you could really see were her teeth, right? Everything else was just bloody, and there was a child there, um, and that was quite um, it was very powerful um, when you, when you see something like that. So that's why I've I've included these pictures in here to to help you to help contextualize everything for you. There's no other reason why I did that. Um, so. Um, Please try not to take offense to them. Understand my reasoning behind it is to um, help you uh, gain a deeper appreciation for what we're actually talking about here. Um, I also understand at this point in time there's this whole thing going on um, with Johnny Depp and Amber Heard and I'm not going to talk about that. We don't know what's happened there yet. Um, I'm not going to call out, say, who is at fault or whatever, but we don't know what happened there. All right. Uh, it's a big old hoopla going on right now. Let's not focus on that. Let's focus on things um, that are more scientific. So why are we even talking about um, intimate partner violence, right? Well, based on research, so based on data from UCR, NCVS, and other uh, self-report studies, we know that intimate partner violence accounts for about 22% of violent crimes committed against women and 4% of violent crimes committed against men. Um, we know that in 2007, okay, 24% of female homicide victims were killed by either a spouse or, or an ex-spouse and 21% were killed by a boyfriend or girlfriend. And then 19% were killed by another family member. In 2008, 99% of, of intimate partner violence against women was committed by male offenders. And 83% of IPV against men was committed by female offenders. We also know that if you're a black woman, you're much more likely to be killed by a spouse than if you were white. Of male homicide, however, only 2% were killed by a spouse or ex-spouse, um, and 3% were killed by a girlfriend or boyfriend, right? So men, overall, men tend to be victimized less within the context of IPV. But it doesn't mean that men don't deserve to be included in the discussion of this victimization. But the research shows that women um, 
uh, experiences more. And then uh, especially uh, minority women um, are at an even increased risk. When we look at more recent um, NCVS data, uh, we see that physical violence by an intimate partner was experienced by almost a third of women, okay, who were included in that study. And more, and more than a quarter of men, 28% in their lifetime. So what that means is that um, when it comes to physical intimate partner violence, all right, so this is not all intimate partner violence, physical intimate partner violence, and the numbers are a little closer between men and women, right? So throughout their lifetimes, about a third of women and a quarter of men have experienced this. Severe physical um, violence was reported um, to be experienced by uh, about a quarter of women and about 13 or 14 percent of men, right? So these are some, some general statistics for us to, to understand why IPV is so important, okay? And you can find these statistics and explained in, in, a, um, in further detail on page 319 in the textbook, right? There's a subsection here called the scope of the problem, right? Some other facts that I'll quickly cover here, some other statistics that we've gotten from, uh, let's see here, where's this from? From several studies conducted by the RAND Corporation and by the uh, NCVS, right? So on a typical day, Domestic violence hotlines receive about uh, 20,800 calls. The presence of a gun in domestic violence cases increases the risk of homicide by 500%, okay? Domestic violence accounts for about 15% of all violent crimes, right? So earlier I, I gave some numbers about men and women. When you combine those numbers, about 15% of all violent crime is I, uh, IPV. Um, domestic violence is the most common among women between ages um, 18 and 24, so this is experienced by women during that age, okay? 19% of domestic violence involves a weapon. Domestic violence victimization is correlated with a higher rate of depression and suicidal behavior, meaning if you've been victimized, you're more likely to be depressed, more likely to consider suicide. And only about 34% of people who are injured by intimate partner violence, receive medical care for their injuries. All right, so these data give us even more uh, understanding why this is a problem in the United States. I know this was a lot of data that I threw at you, but it's, it's important for us to know this when we, disco when we discover and um, examine what, um, you know, what this type of victimization is. So those of you who don't know that uh, IPV or domestic violence is not just physical, okay? Yes, phys once it starts to get physical, it is, it, 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 you know, you're on this path to it being very severe, and we're going to cover that a little bit later. But uh, IPV can be um, any sort of behavior, right, that is either physical, um, psychologically, or sexually harmful that occurs in an intimate relationship. It can include physical aggression. It can include psychological abuse, um, forced sexual intercourse, isolating a person from their family and friends, right? This is actually something you see happen uh, often in uh, domestic violence type of situations is where the aggressor begins to isolate people from those who can pull them out of that situation. Sometimes this is done on purpose. Other times it just sort of happens, okay? It just, the, the person just realizes, oh, whenever my partner talks to this person, we get into more arguments, so I'm going to isolate them, right? Um, monitoring people's movements, right? Restricting their access to, to things. So, so some of you might be sitting here and you say, you know, I check my girlfriend or boyfriend's uh, cell phone, text message, history, and all that stuff every now and then. I check their, their location on find my iPhone or whatever. That is the beginning stages of intimate partner violence, okay? Please know that if you are one of those people who checks the DMs or checks the text messages and phone calls and whatever histories of your partner, you are on the precipice of a slippery slope towards intimate partner violence, right? I know that in today's world, it's becoming a bit of a, um, a norm. It's becoming normal for you to check your intimate partner's um you know, call histories and text messages and all that stuff. But let me tell you something. 
you are on the cusp of moving into a uh, into a violent situation. It starts with things as simple as that. Next thing you know, you're going to be following them. Next thing you know, you're going to be telling them, you can't talk to this person. You can't be friends with this person. You can't go to these types of things. And, 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 and what happens when they don't listen, right? So if you find yourself right now already in a situation like that, please be warned that you are headed into a bad direction. Turn things around now. A lot of IPV starts kind of slow, and we're going to cover that in a little bit. So how have we responded to IPV? Well, there have been some studies conducted, and, 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 and for the most part, there are sort of three overall, um, uh, or I guess four overall uh, responses we've made. I don't really consider the ban on guns a, an actual response uh, to IPV. Um, so essentially, if you if you've been um, found guilty of or convicted of DV or IPV, in, in many states you lose your your gun ownership rights. Okay, um, and this is because we know that that a domestic violence situation tends to go from like you know um, banning people, checking people's DMs, checking people's texts to telling them you can't talk to this person, to starting to isolate them from more people, to starting to um, uh, restrict where they can go and with whom they can interact, to being more um, uh, psychologically violent by being more demanding when it comes to, to, to the sexual expectations, to being more handsy, to being more aggressive physically, to, to hitting, to pushing, to shoving, to punching, to... Um, choking, and then you're on that cusp of considering homicide. That's usually how that goes. Okay, so when you take the gun out of uh, out of that equation, right, it can help prevent some uh, forms of, of 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 homicide, or at least make homicide a lot more difficult to perpetrate. Um, but some other strategies have focused on um. Uh, arresting the uh, the offender, right? So uh, there's a very famous study that was conducted in Minneapolis, right? And so what they did here, and this was by Sherman. So those of you who don't know who Sherman is, Sherman is the godfather of hotspots policing, which in my opinion and, the, and in the opinion of many policing scholars is the best approach to stopping crime. But nonetheless, um, what Sherman did was he gave random, um, he gave these like color-coded cards to different uh, police officers. And so whenever police officers uh, encountered a misdemeanor um, domestic violence situation, based on the card that they pulled, they had to either um, arrest somebody, um, arbitrate, or send the, uh, the, the offender away, right? And so what they found was is that when you made an arrest, right, the, uh, the person was much less likely to reoffend within six months and they found that arrest was the best way to to stop this All right now um some of the criticisms of this um policy is is that what, what often happens is so you make an arrest right and the victim in the heat of the moment is willing to press charges but as that investigation goes on after things cool down the victim becomes less cooperative all uh, a, a lot of times not always but a lot of times uh, victims will become less cooperative because the victimizer will begin to sort of take hold um, of their psychological state and convince them that they would be useless without the um, offender in their life or they might depend on them financially or the person might have more uh, social influence around them. They might be chastised by their uh, entire, entire social group for pressing charges against this person. So what happens a lot of times is the victim will start to um, distance themselves from prosecuting um, the offender and that makes the case for the state more difficult. And this can often lead to re-victimization where the person comes back and they're retaliating against the victim for, for trying to press charges against them. And this happens even more so with restraining and protection orders, right? 
So the whole idea is, is that you use a uh, restraining order to, um, to, uh, to say, hey, stay away from me, right? But just because you have a piece of paper that says stay away from me doesn't mean that people are actually going to listen to it. And that's one of the problems, right? And they found that actually anywhere from 23 to 50% of victims experience re-victimization within a two to four hour follow-up period. Sorry, not hour. Within a two to four month follow-up period. Which really means that there is no difference between those who didn't file a protective order and those who did. Right? They found no difference between those two groups. And so these are, are, are almost not of much use, right? And, and, and the police can only do so much, right? A protective order um, in, in some states, right? It's hard to even get a protective order filed against someone, right? And then there, there's another program um, that is really stupid. Um, and it's, uh, and it's, it's being challenged in a lot of jurisdictions now so there are some programs in certain jurisdictions where if let's say you're a woman you have two children and your husband is beating you and now your husband starts beating one of your kids right and now a, a teacher realizes the kid is all bruised up and the um the teacher goes and says something to the to the child uh, department of child services and now um they start investigating what's happening in your house. They discover that both you and your children are being beaten by your husband. And so what Department of Child Services will do then is they'll take your children away and they will recommend that you and your husband both be charged, your husband be charged with you know some sort of domestic violence charge and you be charged with child neglect for allowing your child to be abused. You can see why this is problematic, right? Because what this also does, it increases the risk for women to seek help for their abuse. And so that's why these programs are now being reconsidered, right? So what it comes down to is that while mandatory arrests are probably the best way to deal with it, there is no silver bullet for dealing with IPV, at least from a legal perspective. Some impacts of this, um, this type of crime on victims uh, include battered women syndrome, uh, learned helplessness, and uh, PTSD. All right? <clears throat> Battered woman syndrome involves any woman that finds herself in an abusive situation. Battered women syndrome works like this. And so it was, it was first described by Walker in 1979 who studied uh, these types of relationships. And so it goes through these three stages, right? Uh, the first phase, um, so what happens is you'll have the, uh, the, the batterer Will, will attempt to reduce their own anxiety or, or tension um, and begins to use a verbal um, sort of uh, insults and, and threats and maybe some light uh, physical violence, right? And then what will happen is usually the woman will respond um, with anger reduction techniques by trying to be, by trying to placate the batterer or avoid um, a, a specifically serious um, uh, abusive episodes, so they'll become apologetic, they'll become submissive. However, <coughs> as tension grows, the, uh, the first phase is followed by intense battering, right? At this time, the victim is su subject to severe uh, physical uh, and verbal abuse, which may include uh, threats of death, or significant in injury. So, so what happens is like this rage builds up in the batterer, right? The um, the the woman usually um, responds with trying to control this, but this doesn't actually do anything. They they try to, to to reduce this tension by placating them, by being submissive. But for some reason, this just feeds the rage of the batterer, and they will then up the ante and begin begin extremely uh, begin to be extremely abusive verbally and physically right and it's followed by this like intense 
episode of violence. And then usually afterwards, the final stage, um, there's a sharp uh, but predict predictable reduction in, in, in the tension, right? This changes to become this cycle, to, to become this loving um, attribution during which the batterer becomes remorseful and apologetic and loving. And what that does is it assures the victim that the battering will not happen again, right? That it will not be repeated. This was an isolated incident. This loving attrition reinforces the woman's commitment to the relationship. And so it starts all over again, right? So that's what happens, right? The, when, like, the it, it starts off with the person getting agitated and then the woman trying to calm things down. That doesn't work. And so they take a massive beating. And then the batterer feels remorse and then tries to overcompensate with loving um, attrition. And then that reinforces the, 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 the victim's uh, faith in the relationship and they stick around. They think, oh, it'll get better. It won't be like this again. This was an isolated incident. Or these are just an isolated couple of incidents. Or maybe this was kind of my fault, right? We call this battered woman syndrome. It's where they won't leave a situation even though it's extremely bad for them, right? Now, yes, men can also be victims in this case, um, but when this term was created, it was back in the 1970s, okay? Now, sometimes battered woman syndrome can get so bad that the uh, victim would eventually um, become violent themselves. They would see sort of the only way of getting out of this um, as killing their uh, the, their partner, right? And so in some cases where we see women uh, murdering people, they murder because of a consequence of battered women's syndrome, but it's not always the case. Victim uh, Victims of intimate partner violence can also learn um, this, uh, they call this learned helplessness because of this totalitarian control, meaning that they feel like it is best for them to just accept abuse as a way of life. This is the best outcome for their life. Somehow, they see that there, that there is no better option for them, right? You become so um, in, sort of entrenched in the, 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 the position you're in. Maybe it's because you have kids with this person. Maybe it's because you rely on them financially. Or maybe it's there are social or cultural implications for the situation that you're in, right? And so you learn that there is really nothing that can be done by this, right? Because of this total control that this person has over you, right? So you accept abuse as a way of life. Oh, this is just the way it is. Everyone must be living like this, right? And you can't see an end to the abuse. You can't see any grass that is greener anywhere else, right? And this usually also has to do with the fact that there's these other outside stressors on you, such as finances, such as children, such as family, such as culture, or other social influences. So what about IPV in LGBTQ relationships? Right, That's something that's important to consider. There have been some studies conducted on this. And it's quite interesting, actually. They found, some of these studies have found that in 21 to 50 percent of all male same-sex couples and 25 to 50 percent of all female same-sex couples there will be some form of IPV that occurs. Women in um, same-sex relationships are also more likely um, to come from uh, heterosexual relationships where violence was an issue. One study conducted by Stanley and colleagues found that 50% of their participants indicated that the violence in their same-sex relationship was bi-directional, which means that both partners were physically violent at some point. And what we find is that the causation and the, um, the, the process, like the, the evolving of the abuse, follows the same lines as... Um, as in heterosexual relationships. 
So, um, which is quite interesting. Now, the problem that LGBTQ uh, community members face is that in some jurisdictions, the there are some legal barriers, right? Some jurisdictions don't even see IPV as a thing between same-sex couples. And so, therefore, you might not be able to get a... Um, a uh, a protection order, or it might not be dealt with in domestic violence courts, right? And in some places, the police are still kind of reluctant to intervene the same way they would if if IPV was occurring between um, uh, a, a heterosexual couple, right? So even though these things are changing a, a little bit, um, we are we are still dealing with a lot of barriers that this community. Um, has to face and to think that IPV is not an issue in the LGBT community community is um, uh, is naive um, it exists and it is serious and um, it is prevalent and uh, uh, the the law the criminal justice system and society must be aware of this and make appropriate accommodations for it so one thing that is uh, quite problematic is when children witness intimate partner violence. And we know that this happens a lot because when we look at, um, at cases that have been referred to child protective uh, agencies, right? IPV can, has been present in anywhere from one quarter to three quarters, depending on the jurisdiction. So that's huge. I mean, that's a lot, right? And also when you look at the ages of uh, victims uh, and offenders, right? You're right at that point where you're having young children at the, you know, in, in the household. And I remember, you know, like I said, when, when I was um, doing my research, there were multiple situations where uh, we showed up to a DV situation or IPV situation and... There were children around, and it was bad. I mean, it was bad. The children were under so much distress. They didn't understand why the police was there. Um, uh, there was one case where where the, the children were taken away by the Department um, of Child Services, and that was extremely traumatic to see. Um, yeah, so it's, it, it's a problem. Right? You have to remember that when you're a child... Right now, when you're an adult, right, you sort of take a lot of things for granted, right? You have a lot more freedom, right? You can go live on your own if you need to, right? You don't feel as um, limited, right? But when you're a child, right, your parents or your guardians are everything to you. They are your entire safety net to you. There is no outside of that world at that moment, right? It is your parents, they are there. They are the ones who've kept you alive up until now. They are the ones who drive you around. They are the ones who feed you, right? And when there is a disruption to that safety, to that security, right, the impacts that ha that, that has on you is extremely, extremely um, impactful and permanent. Right? And so that's why when children are exposed to IPV, when they see this stuff happening, in their households, right? They show they can show internalizing behaviors, meaning they start to become depressed, anxiety, socially withdrawal, right? So they, they sort of go into their own minds, right? They don't want to participate in society anymore, right? They just they're 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 internalizing. Or you might see increased externalizing behaviors where they become hyperactive, they become like the class clowns joke around a lot, or they become aggressive. And over time, what happens is you start seeing these social integration problems, you start seeing low self, self-esteem, and, 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 and most commonly, lower school performance, right? So when you are in a situation like that and you have children, right, you must understand that the children are also being impacted by it, even though they are not the... The, the, the focus of the, the abuse, they are also experiencing abuse and are also considered victims in this situation. 
So you might say to yourself, why do women stay in these situations, right? Well, post-traumatic stress disorder, it can be fear, it can be love and commitment, right? For instance, like I remember when when we did a, uh, a stop while I was doing my research, one of the women, um, you know, she was in a, she was in a bad, she was in bad shape, bad, bad, bad shape. Now both she and her husband had been drinking. Um, and so she was just sort of venting to the police officer and, you know, she, she talked about how sweet and how intense their love was in the beginning of their relationship. When they had that honeymoon phase of their relationship, she was the happiest she had ever been in her life, right? He was so sweet to her. He did all these things, you know, she, she couldn't have imagined being with anyone better or anyone else. And that's the thing, is that that those good feelings at the beginning of the relationship is what kept her there this whole time. Because she saw what it could be. And some of you might be listening to this. You might be in some like four, five, three, two year long relationship that's kind of toxic now, right? You're both just sort of like unpleasant. You're fighting at least once a day. But the thing that keeps you in it is their memories of the honeymoon phase or just the fact that you're comfortable with where you're at right now. It's just there's some sort of consistency. Breaking up with them might create so many problems. There are also uh, cultural or family issues, right? You don't want to bring shame on the family. Some religions, you know, believe that, that women should be more submissive to their husbands, right? Some religions believe that you must not have divorce, right? You cannot have more than one sexual partner in your life right? Some people think that, oh, if you break up a marriage, you're going to hurt the children, right? Where there's even some cultures that say, oh, a little bit of abuse is, is normal. Everyone goes through it. There might also be community reasons. There might not be anywhere for you to go. There might be inadequate resources to you. Um, that You might not actually know that you're being abused. There might not be shelters for you to go. Like, where do you go if you are completely financially dependent on your abuser? Where do you go? What about, what if you're an immigrant and your abuser is your citizenship sponsor? Right, so there are many reasons why people stay in these situations. Some of our individual some of them are cultural, some of them are social, some of them are financial. And when we and we talked about this earlier, but the way that domestic violence usually occurs is that it happens on this continuum, right? It first starts off and you have these little incidents where uh, a normal argument just got a teeny bit out of hand, right? And then you realize whenever you guys get into an argument, it, 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 it always goes from, you know, zero to 65 in like two seconds. And then these arguments begin to happen on a more regular basis, right? And that 0 to 65 goes to 0 to 100, to 0 to 150, right? And then it's to the point where you know, if I say this, then I'm going to get verbally or physically abused. And then it's to the point where it happens all the time. And then if it doesn't go unchecked, or wait, if it goes unchecked, it ends in a homicide. That's the thing. And here's the thing, right? When you look at, when you look, when you watch body camera footage of police showing up to a, to, a, to a situation where someone had murdered their, their intimate partner, right? And they're still there, right? One of the things that these people say, I never thought it would get, it would get to this. I never thought it would, this would happen. I never thought I was capable of doing this. It just happens. That's why this must be stopped. That's why research must focus on this. The criminal justice system has only really cared about this, both in the U.S. and in Canada, for the last 30 years. That's nothing. We need to make this more serious. We need to focus on this. We need to fix this. 
So some studies have looked, I've tried to sort of categorize what are your types of batterers, right? People who are abusers. You get those abusers who are family only, right? Um, they use the least amount of violence, right? Um, they're not necessarily psychopaths. Uh, you don't really see them being violent outside of the home. Um, and they're not, you know, they, they typically feel re remorse, right, afterwards. And, um, and, and that's that. And usually um, when they do get violent, it's a result of some sort of other outside factors such as stress um, or even when they, you know, even they might have uh, witnessed it as children. But these are relatively lower in terms of uh, in terms of the intensity of the abuse and the um, the longevity of it. Then you get your uh, dysphoric borderline abusers. Now these are the people who moderately to severely abuse their their spouses, um, but they but they still don't commit a lot of violence outside of the home. They still sort of keep it towards people in their own um, in in their own households, right? Um, most of them are have suffered some sort of psychological distress, right? They might have a background of, of being abused themselves or, or being rejected by their parents. Um, and they are also more likely to show borderline characteristics like um, uh, being uh, being jealous in their relationships, right? Uh, that is that is the big one. This massive jealousy, not like not allowing, your partner to wear certain clothing outside or not allowing them to wear makeup, right? I remember that was like a thing back in the 90s, right? It was sort of like socially accepted for for uh, boyfriends to tell their girlfriends, oh, you're not, allowed to, you're not allowed to wear makeup anymore. Like, what the hell is that, right? Oh, you're not allowed to talk to these people anymore, right? That is abuse, folks. That is abuse. And then you get your generally violent antisocial folks. These are people who engage in high levels or, or moderate to high levels of violence against their uh, their spouses or their girlfriends or boyfriends. They also will get into spats with people outside of their marriage. So this is so they're just violent people in general who who take it out on their uh, on their their households and people outside of their households. Right? They show. Uh, aspects of, of anti-personality disorder, they engage in criminal behavior, they engage in substance abuse, and they will likely have some sort of arrest record, right? They also probably have a high level of family violence in, in their history and are more likely to associate with deviant peers, right? So these are sort of your three basic uh, batterers. You get your family only. These are the, the ones who, who keep things um, within the family, um, they might seem like a normal person from outside, um, and the, the the type of abuse is usually lower in terms of intensity and longevity. Then you get your dysphoric borderline. These are the people who are a little more intense, but you still don't really see it outside of the household. And then you get your generally violent antisocial people. These are just people where when you found out that they got arrested for DV, you're like, oh, I'm not surprised at all. So what are some risk factors that might increase the, the, the likelihood of IPV turning into homicide. Well, um, usually abusers were low, with lower levels of education um, uh, have a higher chance of, uh, of letting it get to a homicide situation if there is access to a firearm. Remember, again, a firearm makes killing somebody easier, all right, in many ways. Um, if there is a use of illicit drugs from the abuser, or if the, abuser, if the abuser has been successfully separated from the victim, right? When the abuser is a highly controlling abuser, um, when there's a stepchild in the home, or um, when the abuser has already threatened the victim with a weapon. So these are sort of the risk factors that have been shown to be, uh, to, to correlate with IPV that ends in homicide. So what types of intervention programs do we have? Well, we have those that focus on child witnesses. We have those that focus on the victims and then those that focus on the, uh, the batterers. Those that focus on child witnesses are trying to um, prevent any future harm to them. 
right? Those that focus on the victims tend to focus on providing some sort of emergency assistance and increasing their availability of choices um, so that they can get out of that situation. And then obviously the ones that are focused on batterers are there to help them not engage in that activity anymore. So those that are focused on the victims, right? These are your shelters, your hotlines, your relo relocation services, right? Those types of services uh, help ensure your safety. And then for once you've been made safe, you need to now allow these people to realize, wait, there are other options out there for me, right? You need to sort of reverse those effects of that hopelessness, that PTSD and the, the battered woman syndrome, right? Help enhance their self-esteem, uh, recognize that they are being the victims of violence, uh, changing their attitudes, right? Reduce that isolation. Like I remember, for instance, I had a friend and he this was a man who was in an abusive relationship uh, from a woman and this woman would, uh, she was very emotionally abusive to him. Uh, and uh, I remember uh, at some point I, I, uh, I, I told him to go to a bar when when this when this uh, when this uh, woman was out of town, uh, he was by himself, and I said, "Go to a bar, and just see what happens." Right, and so what happened was is that a woman came and talked to him and showed him some affection. Right, and at that very moment, he realized that he needed to get he he was in an abusive relationship and he needed to get out because what that person had done to him is that they had abused him so much that they made them they made him feel um, insecure, lowered his self-esteem, he gained about 80 pounds, right? Uh, she made him feel ugly, unwanted, and that he's lucky to be just with her, right? And so she gets out, she, she leaves for a business thing, he goes out to the bar, all of a sudden a woman talks to him, and he realizes, oh wait, I am not ugly. I am not unlovable. There are other options out there. And that's all it took was for him to just realize, oh wait, I'm wanted by someone else. I'm not, this is not my how my life has to be. And so that's what this ongoing counseling helps with. It helps you realize, wait, there's more out there than this. I am not tied to the situation for the rest of my life. There is hope. Then those interventions that help children, right? They focus on sort of the crisis intervention, making sure that the people are safe, um, making sure that there's a plan um, to, to, to help these students when they're in that situation, right? Then there's also ongoing treatment to help, um, to help the children as they're developing uh, so that these, uh, these experiences did not, um, you know, to sort of undo some of that inward or external, those internal or external behaviors, right? And then also there are parent-child groups that help um, enhance the bonding between ch children and the, the parents, especially when, uh, you know, when the child was a, a, a witness to that abuse. And then interventions that focus on the, um, the, the batterers, um, anger management, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, and then psychoeducational approaches. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is probably the best one, but the problem is um, that a lot of these interventions uh, see IPV as like a product of a, of, a, um, of a larger issue at hand. And so what happens is instead of um, focusing on the intimate partner violence, a lot of these programs will focus on, well, what causes you to get angry, right? And so they, they, they sort of skirt around or don't necessarily um, acknowledge um, the the uh, the IPV they, they acknowledge more the anger or whatever it is that, that's outside of it um, so yeah that's everything I have for you today um, be sure to check the textbook be sure to do all the quizzes and everything and if you have any questions shoot me an email and as always chill vibe